encourage automation? Because you say that it will liberate people. How? Well, it, <clears throat> there's a few levels to it. First, what has been the greatest source of oppression on this planet since recorded history? Labor. Yeah. And I would say in some sense that's what the political discussion is about. But we, we've, we've skittered off into these radical oversimplifications, which is something like, well, if, if you have more than another person, you're an oppressor. So if we can finally remove that ownership, labor, that old classist duality with the use of automation, that would be profound just on that level. I'm saying scarcity is certainly a fact of reality, but not in even remote proportion the way it used to be. We need to orient our system towards the interest to create an abundance, not towards the interest of preserving scarcity. They say inequality is a problem. It's, yeah, yeah, inequality is a problem. Like it's, it's a terrible problem. But then they say, well, it's probably a function of our political and economic systems and we could fix those. It's like, no. This system perpetuates inequality and larger and larger extensive inequality. You cannot argue that the state alone is the only interference attribute that enables the type of extensive inequality that we see. Because all you have to do is compare different countries to see the difference between those that have very rigid controls, hence state control, not necessarily in the highly coercive way that we see in the U.S. tax system and the like, but still they are limiting the market very directly and regulating it very specifically from the top down, and they have much less violence, they have much less homicide rates, they have much less inequality and all the mental and psychological neuroses that are born of that. It's not a function of our political and economic systems, or if it is, it's at such a deep level that we don't know what drives it, and we certainly don't know how to control it. The most powerful force, the most positive force we do have of the whole of human civilization is since the Industrial Revolution, we're able, we're able to do more and more and more with less and less and less. Buckminster Fuller was a great storyteller and he drew a U shape. This is a canyon, he said. There were people living on each side who needed to communicate and trade, but they couldn't get across. So they tried to figure out what they could do and some of them started to dig up rocks and throw them into the canyon. Eventually the canyon completely filled up with rocks and it became the first bridge. The amazing thing about it was is that it took millions of tons of stone and it took years and years to build and all these tons of stone were used just to hold up a few hundred and fifty pound people carrying something on their back to get across. But it enormously increased wealth because they could trade. But they discovered that there was a problem. There was a stream at the bottom, and the stream water was building up on the back end and causing a problem. So a few brave souls climbed down into the canyon, and they knocked a few stones out at the very bottom, and some of the water could get through. They made a bigger hole, and then a bunch of the rocks collapsed, and the hole disappeared. So they did it again. And they kept doing it until they began to discover that when the hole was a certain shape, it didn't fall back down. When they had discovered the arch, the key to an arch is its shape. An arch is actually not a thing, it's a hole of a certain shape. As they, they learned about what made better arches, what shape was absolutely best for keeping all those stones and, and the people on top of the bridge from falling into the earth, resisting gravity, they learned how to shape the arch in just the right way and the arch kept getting bigger and bigger. They were learning to do more with less. And that is the driving force that can create equitable, equitable distribution and peace on this planet. The title of this talk is Economic Calculation in a Natural Law Resource-Based Economy. And this will be the definitive expression, at least in the condensed form, of the movement, something that's been long overdue. We'll have probably over a thousand footnotes and sources. The problem is that we have a global economic tradition still in place, rooted in 16th century pre-industrial handicraft-oriented thought, that places the act of consuming, buying and selling as the core driver of all social unfolding. The best analogy I can think of is to consider the gas pedal on a car. The more consumption of fuel, the faster it goes, and buying things in our world is the fuel. If you slow down consumption, economic growth slows, people lose jobs, purchasing power declines, and things become destabilized and so forth. And so we're also being driven into this inequality corner by, I would say, by the postmodernists and the neo-Marxists, because they say this is the pernicious thing. They say, well, the reason that some people have more than others is because every hierarchy is based on arbitrary power, and they're all oppressors. See, this is part of what seems to drive inequality, is that as you get successful, the opportunities 
that come your way start to multiply and they don't multiply linearly they multiply exponentially and so when you start moving up you start moving up faster and faster and faster and faster and then you'll hit a point where you have so many opportunities that you don't even know what to do with them and so it's a non-linear improvement but the 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 downside of that is and you might have had periods in your life where that were like this too where let's say you start to get depressed and then you start to drink because you're depressed and then you start to isolate yourself because you're drinking and you're depressed and because you're drunk and depressed then your friends start to abandon you and then you lose your job it's like you're not going downhill in a straight line you're going downhill faster and faster and faster till you fall off a cliff and that seems to be how the world works it's like there's a center point it's unstable things improve then they improve exponentially and things fall and then they fall off exponentially and that seems to be what's driving inequality so i hope it is clear that the system simply does not reward or even support environmental sustainability in the form of conservation. Instead, it, re it rewards servicing, turnover and waste. The more problems and inefficiencies we have, not to mention the more insecure, materialistic and needy the population becomes. You start to succeed and the probability that you'll continue to succeed starts to expand. Mm. Like, so, but does that not mean, Jordan, that would you then reject any attempt to alter mm. systems in favour of fairness? Because it, it seems to me that the focus is on, like, and as it would be for a clinical psychologist, mm -hmm. individual change. Now, part of my personal experience is without individual change, social change is sort of irrelevant. And many well, okay, great but, gurus but would you say... Answered, you answered it right then and there. It's yes, like... the huge wealth gap we see today is reminiscent of all the wealth gaps in history because of different levels of advantage that are achieved by a corporation or a political institution of course, we all know corporations and political institutions are one today. So you it's, think it's, that the politics is happening at a lower level? The phenomenology that's uh, where the dis, where the that's significant is, ha, is is a bigger tide, we, and we, within it, political systems are absolutely. just flowing about. Oh, but that doesn't absolutely. mean we should dismantle the ones we have in search of fairer, more just, better well, ones. If particularly could, if they're empirically not working. And they always really have been. If you go back to kings, the kings usually ran the ships. They got everything back, and then they would distribute it to their to their traders and everything else. The kings and everything in feudalism, mercantilism were very similar. And then we ended up with capitalism. So in this thing called the non-aggression principle, and what frustrates me again is that everything you speak of, I agree with within the principles that you advocate. See, I don't agree with the that the idea of the market, uh, as you as you conceive of it, is is just that a system of voluntary exchange with non-coercion, and people just follow this basic ethical guideline that everything's going to be fine. I look at it from its root source and course of human evolution, and, and using history as a guide. I look at the root psychology of what it means to have this concept that's preve pre prevailing in society, where you're supposed to be put on a pedestal for gaining while others suffer. This psychology and value system disorder is ever pervasive and it really does define the state. And I can't deny- well, okay. If you and I exchange something voluntarily, by definition, we are both better off because of that exchange, right? So the old example is if I have a dollar and you have a pencil and we voluntarily exchange those two items, then by definition, in praxeologically, in reality, foundationally, rationally, empirically, I must want the pencil more than I want my dollar, and you must want my dollar more than you want your pencil, because we're freely exchanging those things. So in a free market exchange, two, the two parties who voluntarily exchange are by definition better off. Uh, they have, and, and this is true if I decide to go and work for someone rather than start my own company. Voluntarism. Action action based on non-coercion is probably the best definition, right? Voluntarism? Mm -hmm. Okay. There are two basic broad presuppositions, if you will, inherent to this common concept, and especially in economic use. The first is a little bit difficult to describe because it's, it's, it's hard for people to relate to it at all, but I'm going to give it a shot. The first is this distorted implication of free will. Most people are, are powerfully... Their intuitions are powerfully shaped by the, the illusion, the sense that they have f the freedom to consciously author their thoughts and actions. So people feel that there is a compelling subjective mystery and they don't, that no one has been able to give an argument about how it would map onto to physical reality, but people feel that the, 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 the experience is so compelling that there's just no reason to, to worry about it. This is the state from which we need to live. As though any action we manifest 
exists in a vacuum. Absent the ever-pervasive conscious and subconscious social and psychological pressures we endure on a daily basis. Then there are people like Dan who uh, have a different, from my view, essentially change the subject. I mean, the, the, the disagreement between Dan and myself is essentially this. It's like we're living in a world where most people believe in Atlantis and they believe in the underwater kingdom and, and you know, they, they, they read Plato closely trying to figure out where it was and, and um, I want to say Atlantis doesn't exist, it didn't exist, people are confused about Atlantis. Well, uh, in my own work um, I find that in spite of all my labors for many years there's a lot of scientists that still are just tone deaf and, and obtuse about free will. They take most simple-minded definition of free will that's out there and discover that that kind of free will is an illusion. Well, yeah, we've known that for you know more than a hundred years, uh, but that's not what the issue is. If they think that's the issue, then, then they should go back to school. Uh, Dan wants to say is that Atlantis is really Sicily. And he'll give a whole argument about why Sicily answers to many of the claims that people are making about Atlantis. And I want to say, no, but, but they're still talking about being underwater. Now, Sicily <laughs> doesn't do that. And he says, well, Sicily is a great place, and there's reasons to visit, and let's talk about Sicily. <laughs> We're the only ones that have free will. It's something that evolved. It's morally important. That's why free will is important, because we want to be, and should want to be, morally competent agents, agents who can take responsibility for their actions. That's the heart of free will. And when he and I argue about this, he begins to respond to me as though I'm saying Sicily doesn't exist. And that's what, so there's a, there's a fair amount of talking past one another in, in these kinds of debates. Uh, of course Sicily exists, but the people who are talking about underwater, an underwater kingdom are at the very least confused. And, that, and that's the situation we're in with free will. Humans have a limited capacity to control their own behavior. It's a fact. We exist in a continuum of social influences that are invariably subject to the behavioral propensities and reactions of the culture we inhabit. That said, as a broad overarching consideration, the second more specific issue is that there is a clear and present fallacy that engagement at all in the market system is voluntary as though we are all just equal in our reductionist existence as voluntary exchangers. This just might be the most absurd concept of all when it comes to this type of worldview. The market system's structural imposition for survival itself, in my view unnecessarily given the state of technology and our capacity to create an abundance, coerces all human beings to submit to labor for income. While libertarians believe that no person should initiate force against another person, or libertarians believe in a right of self-ownership, or libertarians are against any form of aggression. Regardless of how you state the basic libertarian principle, somewhere in that statement, you're going to have an ought statement, a should statement, or a statement pertaining to rights. And of course, rights have implicit within them ought statements. In other words, you'll have to say something like, people ought not to aggress. So in the very statement of the essence of libertarianism, you are already hip deep in ethics. How is voluntary trade coercive? That just seems to me like saying lovemaking is rape. It just seems like you're just jamming two opposite things together and because, calling them the same. Because the act of trade itself is coercive. I'm not saying that the- And how is the act of trade coercive? Because people have to trade in this system to survive unnecessarily. They have to do something. They don't have to trade. They have to do. Well, have how to, do they have to trade? They have to either trade. They can their go. Labor, they can go and and I mean, ninety-eight percent of the world's surface is uninhabited. They can go and live in oh. the woods, and they can grow their own food, oh, and they true. can hunt their own animals. I don't understand how it is they have to trade. Uh, I mean, people don't right. have to trade. I you think that the point right. that I'm making is it's to their advantage to trade. Oh. I think people find that the division of labor, like I fish and you grow wheat and we, we trade or whatever, the division of labor and all of that is economically productive, that people specialize in doing things and then trade the results of that labor so we don't all have to become good at everything. I think people find it advantageous to trade, but saying how that somehow forces them to trade, uh, I think is not clear to me.
in the context of market economics, in the context of trade, in the context of everything that you speak of, but they use the arm of the state to their advantage for their elitist purposes. Do I think that's right? Absolutely not. I would love, Stefan, to see the type of market that you talk about. The problem is it's impossible. There will always be a gravitation towards these power consolidations. But Peter, come on, just saying that something is, poss is impossible doesn't make it so. But when you say the market creates the state, what you would then, I think, seem to be arguing was that at some point in the past, there existed uh, a, a free market, which then created a state where no state existed before. And it would seem to me, based on my understanding of history, that governments have been the dominating uh, factor mm -hmm. throughout history. And they can be sort of local tribal governments like the warlords and the Genghis Khans. And, but that's because as a state, uh, in a free market, it would not be possible to do that. In a, like an, an anarchic, no state free, free what I market. Find, what I find interesting. And of course, there are many people in the world that still look at this causality in reverse. In some economic views, state government is deemed the central problem, as opposed to the self-interest and competitive advantage-seeking ethos inherent to market capitalism. What's interesting about that argument is that you're basically admitting that that propensity is there. As the argument goes, if state power was removed or reduced dramatically, the market and society would be free of most of its negative effects. Basically saying that it's a natural... If there's a state, yes. It's a natural propensity for this type of interest and power. So if there isn't a state, it wouldn't happen. That's, that's interesting. I don't know if I agree with that because if the interest is there to create some type of power consolidation to maintain differential advantage, to override the interests of other producers, to secure wealth and market share for a particular group, that could manifest in all sorts of other ways. I mean, I look at the state as just one example of how this power consolidation tendency materializes. The problem with this argument is that it forgets that capitalism is just a variation of a scarcity-driven specialization and property-based exchange system, a system which actually goes back millennia in one form or another. Early settlements naturally needed to protect themselves as resource and land acquisition moved forward over time. Armies were created to protect resources from invading forces and the like. At the same time, people were working to engage, ag engage agriculture and handicraft, and it revealed labor and exchange value in the form, in a very primitive form. Hence, property value in the midst of this scarcity demanded regulation and laws, not only to protect property, but to protect commerce and also avoid scams and fraud in transactions. This is the seed of the state. The market is a game and people can cheat. You need regulation. This is the basic problem. The market also allows, and here's the punchline, that regulation to be purchased by money. Therefore, there is no guaranteed integrity. The state and the market both battle each other and complement each other. You will always have regulatory power centers in a market economy. The state and the market are inseparable. They go hand in hand. Because I think the problem is deeper than that. I, I don't think the fundamental problem is that people don't have enough money. I think the fundamental problem is that human beings in some sense are beasts of burden. And if they're not given, if they're not provided with a place where they can accept social responsibility, social and individual responsibility in an honorable manner, they degenerate and die. Now, as an aside, people often challenge this reality with moral or ethical arguments, which, I'm sorry to say, are entirely culturally subjective. In a world where everything is for sale, where the re reward reinforcement, the operant condition, is directly tied to seeking personal advantage and gain, who is to say where the lines should be drawn in that process? This is why moral principles without structural reinforcement are useless. In the end, the question isn't what is morally right or what is morally wrong. The question is what works and what doesn't. And sometimes it takes a great deal of time for the truth of such patterns to materialize. Uh, let me give you the example that I like to use from the 19th century. Uh, libertarians were very involved, as you may know, in the pre-Civil War era with the abolition of slavery. They were at the cutting edge, so to speak, of the abolitionist movement individuals like William Lloyd Garrison, Lysander Spooner, Wendell Phillips, and others. Now, their argument was explicitly libertarian. They explicitly argued on the basis of self-ownership. Throughout the abolitionist literature are constant references to self-ownership as the moral objection to slavery. 
they accuse slave owners as being, as they put it, man stealers because they deprived the slave of that which was properly his own, namely his body, his freedom. Now, there developed a very important split in the abolitionist, or not in the abolitionist movement, but in the anti slavery movement generally. The abolitionists were in favor of, the immediate end, of an immediate end to slavery, by which they meant as fast as is humanly possible. They argued that there should be no other considerations which override the slave's right to his own life and freedom. For example, most people, rightly so, see abject human slavery historically as a morally wrong condition. But let's dig deeper into the characteristics and think more deeply. I think it is much more productive to recognize that slavery didn't work in the sense that it was culturally unsustainable. Bigotry in all forms is not just ugly, it is culturally unsustainable because it generates conflict. There was another group uh, which became known as the gradualists who argued, who agreed with the abolitionists. They said, well, it's true that slavery is wrong, it's evil, it should be gotten rid of, but they added on eventually. What they argued was that should slavery cease immediately, it would wreak economic havoc on the South in particular, but also on the Northern industrial states, which relied very heavily on Southern agriculture. So what they did was introduce an argument, an economic argument, trying to show that the immediate abolition of slavery would wreak economic havoc, and therefore slavery had to be phased out in increments rather than immediately. This was a very important and bitterly fought contest between the two sides. Now, it's important to note how the abolitionists responded to this. They did not necessarily try to argue that the immediate abol abolition of slavery would not have these terrible economic consequences. What they argued was that this economic sort of argument was irrelevant because what had to take precedence was the right of the slave to his own liberty. And this was the important argument. Now here, it seems to me, is a very, very clear example that can arise and has arisen in many lesser forms, a very clear example of a conflict between a moral and an economic argument. And the abolitionists recognized clearly that the moral argument was the real basis their, for their philosophy, and therefore that had to be the guiding principle, as indeed I think it has to be the guiding principle for libertarians today. I'm not aware of any slave-owning society that did not undergo large slave rebellions. Those resources need to be funneled down to the people who have zero so that they have an opportunity to at least get to the point where they can innovate and so the bloody, whole bloody thing doesn't wobble and fall. It's unstable and again, therefore, unsustainable. Right, because the lefties say, uh oh, too much inequality. And they need to be listened to because the evidence is quite clear. If you let the inequality ramp up enough, the whole system destabilizes because the people at the bottom think, fuck it, we'll just, we'll just flip the system upside down. Right. No one wants that. And market capitalism is on the same path. There are more slaves in the world today operating within the bounds of the market economy than any time in human history. Class warfare. This leads us well into the subject of class warfare and socioeconomic inequality. The long history of so-called socialist outcry has largely been about this constant and inhumane imbalance on one level or another. A great deal of time has been spent by many critics of capitalism describing how it is indeed a system of exploitation, which inherently separates a society into stratified economic layers with a higher class given dominance over the lower structurally. It's structurally built right in. And if you're one of those people that doesn't agree with this reality, ask yourself why there has been one labor strike after another in the past 300 years, why worker unions even exist, why CEOs often tend to make hundreds of times more money than the common worker, or why 46% of the world's wealth is now owned by 1% which are almost exclusively of what we could call the capitalist ownership class. Inequality and class separation is a direct mathematical result of the market's inherently competitive orientation, which divides individuals in small groups as they work to compete against each other for survival and security. It is entirely individualistically oriented, driven by a core incentive system based around isolated self-preservation assuming the need to constantly reinforce one's security financially, since the market climate, the environment gives no certainty whatsoever of well-being in and of itself. Fear and greed. The rich get richer because the model favors them and the poor basically stay the same because the system works against them by comparison. It is structurally classed. 
Those with more money have more options and influence than those with less. You are only as free, as they say, as your purchasing power will allow you to be. And the credit system is a perfect example. Money is treated as nothing more than a product in the, in the credit system, in the banking system. Money is sold by banks via loans for profit, which comes in the form of interest. If you miss payments or violate your contract, often the interest rate does what? It goes up because you are now considered a higher risk consumer. If you fail to meet that interest or future payments, you might default on the loan. You punish, your punishment, excuse me, is the ruining of your credit rating or reputation in the financial circles. And once that happens, your financial flexibility is even more stifled as your economic access is limited. That's the opiate crisis in mm. the West right now. Like men need, men who, who are men don't need money. They need function. This, people see this as this, the way things are, but they don't realize how insidious this is. This compounds the lower classes to stay low for reasons and forces of coercion that are built, built into the structure that are beyond their control.